Now, many times when you're solving mathematical problems, you'll want to obtain an analytical solution to that particular problem. Analytical solutions are basically just exact solutions to a particular problem. For example, if you have an equation you have to solve, then the analytical solution to that question will probably just be y equals to something in terms of x. The answer is exact. Now, however, sometimes finding the analytical solution to a mathematical problem isn't always the best way to approach the problem. Maybe because one, it might take way too long to come up with the analytical solution, or maybe sometimes it's just plain impossible to come up with the analytical solution to a particular problem. And so many times in order to solve mathematical problems, we have to go about it in a different way and instead find an approximate solution to those particular problems, finding the numerical solutions to those problems. Now these numerical solutions most of the times are just going to be estimates of the actual solution to the mathematical problem. But many of the times these solutions themselves are already accurate enough and can be found in a much quicker time than trying to find the analytical solutions to those mathematical problems. Now for different mathematical problems there are many different ways that you can approach it and obtain a numerical solution. However these different methods will have different degrees of accuracy and most of the time will also take a different amount of time in order to obtain a solution. Now most of the time the more accurate methods of obtaining numerical solution will actually take a longer computational time and vice versa. But in this particular video I want to talk about one particular way that we can obtain numerical solutions to mathematical problems. Now this method falls more towards this side of the numerical methods spectrum. It's rather quick However, it's actually a lot less accurate than many other different ways of obtaining numerical solutions. And it involves generating random numbers and a bit of probability. And it's called the Monte Carlo method. Now the Monte Carlo method was named after a city called Monte Carlo, which is a part of a country called Monaco, which is southeast of France. Now Monte Carlo is really well known for their casinos and if you sort of think about it you know you could you could probably see why the Monte Carlo method which involves random numbers was named after a city which is well known for casinos and randomness and probability of playing cards and whatnot. Now there's a couple of different variations of the Monte Carlo methods depending on the type of mathematical problem that you have at hand. However, all of these different variations tend to follow a very similar general set of steps, which goes a bit like this. Firstly, you have to come up with a domain for your random set of numbers, between which range can your randomly generated numbers fall under. Secondly, you have to generate random inputs, generate random numbers which will fall under your domain that you already specified earlier. Thirdly, you take these numbers that you just found out and do a deterministic computation with them or basically for example plug them into a particular equation so that you get out some sort of an output. And lastly, you have to take the numbers that you got and then analyze it and get a numerical answer as appropriate. Now the Monte Carlo method itself isn't that particularly accurate. The percentage error from this method will equal to 1 divided by the square root of the number of random samples that you generate. However, it's rather quick, especially when you have data with high number degrees of freedom. Now what do I mean by this? Well let's say you have a problem that deals with moving particles. The particle itself will have some coordinate in space, an x, y, z coordinate, and that itself is already three degrees of freedom. But then it will also have to be moving, and so we'll have three more components for its velocity, and that's another three degrees of freedom. So the particle itself will have six degrees of freedom. And in order to find numerical solutions for problems such as this one, it's actually better to use Monte Carlo methods compared to other numerical methods that you could probably use. Now, all of this looks rather confusing, doesn't it? So let's show you how the Monte Carlo method works use an example. Now one big use of the Monte Carlo method in mathematics is to do numerical integrations. Now assuming you have a random shape like this and you want to find the area of this random shape, what you can do is you can put this shape onto a piece of paper and then start throwing darts at it. Assuming all the darts you throw actually ends up on the piece of paper, the probability of the darts actually ending up on the shape will equal to the proportion of the paper that is taken up by the shape itself. 
what you're doing is you're finding the experimental probability that the dart actually lands within the shape and using that experimental probability to come up with the proportions of the area taken up by the shape and then hence the area of the shape itself, an approximation of the shape of an area itself. And this in a way is how Monte Carlo method works with numerical integration. Now since integration is just finding the area under a graph, you can use this very same thought into numerically integrating a function with the Monte Carlo method. And so now I'll give you an example. Maybe let's say we have some function that we want to integrate. Maybe something like natural log of x divided by x. And you want to integrate this from 1 to 10. How do you integrate this? Now this particular problem can actually be solved analytically using calculus. However, for this video, we're more interested in the numerical solutions to this problem. So let's try to solve the problem using the Monte Carlo method. So first, let's look at the graph for this equation. The graph of this equation actually looks a bit like this. And this is the area under the graph that we're interested in. So how do I use the Monte Carlo method to integrate this numerically? Well, first, I have to come up with some sort of a domain for the random points that I will be generating. So let me draw a box over this graph like this. And so I'll say that all the points that I generate will have to lie somewhere within this box. So what I can do is I can generate a random point within the box and then check whether this generated point actually falls under the graph. Now, in order for me to obtain an accurate numerical solution, I have to do this many, many times. Maybe say, for example, a million times. And then after generating a million points, I can then take these million points and then do some calculations with it, finding the proportion of the points that falls under the graph, and then hence be able to find the area under the graph, and then be able to find the answer to the integral problem that I've been after. Now, of course, if I want to do a million randomly generated points, it's gonna take me forever if I do it by hand. And this is why I'll hand it over to my computer friend over there who's going to show you how to do it on computer. Yay! All right, let's go. It's just way too hot. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be demonstrating how to perform the Monte Carlo method on the computer. I'm basically going to just take the instructions that I already told you earlier and translating those instructions into lines of code on the computer. And for demonstration purposes, I'm going to be writing all my codes in Python because it's a very simple language and it's the only computer language that I actually know. So before I even do anything, first of all, I'm going to import a few modules. So I'm going to import a module called math and I'm going to import another module called random. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define two different counters, right? So the first counter is going to just be like the counter that counts how many points have been generated. And first I'm going to set it to equal to zero. And the second one is just going to be how many of them is actually inside the area, which I'll call in area. Again, we'll set that to be zero at first. Now the next bit is the actual interesting bit. It's the bit that we actually like get into the real juice of like the Monte Carlo method. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define something called a while loop, right? So we're just going to say that a while count is still less than 1 million. So what the while loop is for is that as long as the conditions is met, as long as the count is still less than a million, the instructions that's under the while loop will still be run continuously, will still be looped through. So because we want a million samples, we're not going to stop the loop until we have a million random points, until the count actually reaches one million. And so in each loop, what we have to do is we have to generate a random point and then see if that random point actually lies under the area or not. And if it does lie under the area, we add one to the counter for in area. And so how do we do this? Well, first of all, we have to generate the random point, right? So 
the random point will have two bits. It will have an X coordinate and it will have a Y coordinate. So I'll generate those two components separately. So first we're gonna have to generate the X coordinate, which I'll call X chord. And to generate this random coordinate, we're gonna use a function called random. We're gonna use a random function. It's gonna be random.uniform and we're gonna set a lower bound and an upper bound for the random number that can be generated. If you look back at the diagram for the box that I drew like earlier this video, you'll see that the lower bound and the upper bound is going to be one and 10 for the X coordinate. So I'm just gonna put that in, it's gonna be one and 10. Fact. Now I'm gonna to have to do something similar for the Y coordinate. So we look at the graph again, we'll see that the lower bound for the y coordinate is just going to be zero. Now what about the upper bound of the graph? So between x equals one and x equals 10, the highest value that y can be will be one over e. And so that will be the upper bound for the y coordinate of our randomly generated points. And so we'll just put that into our code. The upper bound for the y coordinate will be one divided by the number and so now we have our randomly generated point, which has got both an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And so what we have to do next is we have to check whether this point lies underneath the curve or not. How do we do that? So let's visualize this. Let me bring back the image from earlier of the curve. So let's say we have a point that's lying somewhere within the box, the randomly generated point. Now, if you take your X corner and then put it into the function, you'll get out a Y value, which just corresponds to a certain point on that curve. And so to see if your randomly generated point lies underneath the curve or not, you just have to take your randomly generated Y coordinate and compare it against that value that is given out by the function. If your randomly generated Y coordinate is lower than the value you get out of the function, it means that the point lies underneath the curve. So let's put that into lines of codes, right? If the Y coordinate of the point is less than the function, which will be as I defined earlier, function at that particular value of x or at the x coordinate, then what we can do is we can add one to the counter which counts how many points lies within the area or the variable in area. So if this condition is satisfied, we're going to add one to in area. So that's going to be in area plus equal one. Another thing we have to also do is we have to also add one to count so that we can keep track of how many times we already completed the loop. And so now what I have is I have a randomly generated point and we already checked whether that point lies underneath the curve or not. And we're gonna be performing this entire operation here a million times or until the count is actually at a million. Then we stop this process. So after a million loops, we're gonna have some number of points which lies underneath the graph, which is already being tallied. What next do we do with this information? Well, the probability of a randomly generated point lying underneath the graph will equal to the area underneath the graph or the integral that we're interested in divided by the total amount of area that the points could have landed on, which is the area of the rectangle, the box that we drew earlier. And then now this probability can also be found experimentally, which is the whole bit of us randomly generating points and seeing where they land in the very first place. And so the probability of the point landing underneath the graph can be found experimentally. And that will just be the proportions of the randomly generated points that we have, which lies underneath the graph. And so we can rearrange this a bit. And so we'll get that the area under the graph or the answer of the integral that we're actually interested in will equal to the number of points that actually lands underneath the graph divided by the total number of points that we generated times the area of the box that the points could have existed in. The total area of the box would just be 9 times 1 over e which will equal to 9 over e. And so I'll just put that into my code that the area of the box will just equal to 9 divided by e. And so now in order for us to find the area of the integral, all I have to do is I just have to take the area of the box and multiply it by the proportions of the points that lies underneath the graph. Right, so the proportion of the point that lies underneath the graph will equal to how many point lies within the area or in area divided by the total number of points that we have, which is the count, which should be a million. And we're gonna multiply that by the total area of the box. 
And so here's the moment of truth. I'm gonna run this code and we'll see how it goes. So let's do this. What does it give us the answer? It gives me 2.6507. So let's only consider the first three decimal places. So the answer to this integral, according to the Monte Carlo method, as I already did earlier, is going to equal to 2.651 to three decimal places. And the error, the percentage error, will be 0.1%, which is one divided by the square root of a million, or how many points we've randomly generated. And how does this fare to the actual answer? Looks right to me. Now the Monte Carlo method has loads and loads of other applications, not just numerical integration. Monte Carlo method also has many other uses outside of mathematics, applied into other fields from physics and engineering all the way to statistics or even finance. Except I don't have time to explain all those uses because I have to end the video somewhere. So I'm going to end it right here. Thank you very much for watching this video and I hope you had a great time and I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.